Hello, my name is Leah McDonald. I'm a social worker at the Albany, New York Stratton VA Medical Center. I'm here to talk to you today about Veterans Health Care Administration. I'm the program manager for the post 9 11 military to VA program. The post 9 11 program has two parts under the transition and care management program umbrella. If you're interested in locating your point of contact at your local facility, please feel free to access the links that I've provided in the slide deck. The post 9 11 transition and care management program consists of two parts the VA DOD liaison program that provides direct access and VA health care for ill and injured service members by coordinating an individualized transition of health care between Department of Defense and VA. The M to VA program provides improved access to VA health care, as well as ongoing biopsychosocial support to new veterans through comprehensive and specialized transition assistance and care management. We recognize that oftentimes veterans who are transitioning out of the military or returning from deployments might experience some reintegration challenges. These might include loss of camaraderie, loss of purpose and identity, a change in structure, reconnecting to relationships and navigating changes within the family, feeling disconnected from civilian life, coping with illness or injury to include invisible wounds, as well as financial changes, unemployment and underemployment. The VA Liaison Healthcare Program is created for those service members who might be placed on profile and be identified for a medical board or transition out of the military. They provide direct access and coordinated individualized health care in coordination with Department of Defense, Warrior Transition Units, and Medical Command Case Managers. The VA Liaisons are trained social workers or nurses who are either stationed on site at military treatment facilities or might work virtually to support designated regions of military treatment facilities. VA liaisons coordinate the transfer of service members and veterans from the military treatment facility to their closest VA medical center for the most appropriate specialized services and care related to their medical conditions. The VA liaisons partner with the post 9 11 M2VA case management program manager as their primary point of contact to ensure transitioning service members and veterans are registered or enrolled in their home VA medical and facility, that they obtain appointments as quickly and as appropriately as possible, and that they connect with their case management team for screening and ongoing case management if indicated, as well as things like whole health groups, introduction to taking charge of your life, um, and peer support. The VA liaison program in this area can provide coordination, collaboration, education, as well as clinical warm handoffs to the m to va staff. I've included contact for Patricia Scott, who covers our area. Please feel free to contact Patricia if you have questions or concerns. She can be reached at 315-480-3554 or via email at patricia.scott2 at va.gov. The Transition and Care Management Program's second team is the post 9 11 Military to VA or M to VA program. Every VA has an experienced post 9 11 M to VA team that is specially trained in the unique needs of transitioning service members and post 9 11 era veterans. Each post 9 11 M to VA team will assist with coordination of VA healthcare and ensure that your care is veteran centered and that you're aligned with the benefits and services that you have earned. So what do we do in the post 9-11 M2VA program? We work very closely with our business office around enrollment. We do not actually facilitate enrollment. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how that can be facilitated. A lot of service members don't recognize that you actually have to apply for VA health care to take advantage of this benefit. And so we work very closely with our business uh, office and our health eligibility experts around eligibility and enrollment and can facilitate uh, a warm handoff to these folks if needed for veterans who have not yet applied for VA health care. <clears throat> we provide initial and ongoing coordination and case management, and we screen all of our post 9-11 service members and veterans for high risk factors and case management needs. 
So what this means is if you were to establish care at the VA, we're not waiting for a consult. We're not waiting for you to contact us necessarily. However, our contact information is out there and we're happy to assist um, and, and provide referrals and resources. Uh, but if our veterans do establish care at our medical center, we receive a list of these newly enrolled veterans every month and we are tasked with outreaching to those veterans. So you receive phone calls or perhaps a letter if you don't um, if we don't reach you on that phone call. And during that phone call, we're gonna offer you a brief screening. And that screening is really going to see if you have any what we call care coordination or case management needs. Veterans can certainly opt out to this of this screening. Everything is optional, um, but just know that this might occur if you were to establish care for the first time at your local VA. And we also do a lot of outreach and community education, similar to um, yellow ribbon events and partnering with Department of Defense partners and partners in our community around resources and establishing care and services that our veterans may need in their community. So what is the screening like? Uh, so we are going to identify, you know, what are your preferred points of contact? Just verifying that we have accurate information, demographic information on your address, um, perhaps your next of kin, emergency contacts, also emails. Um, we use a system called My Healthy Vet where uh, perhaps you're interested in having electronic access to your VA healthcare record and communicating securely via email with your providers. So um, we'll ask you questions about this. We're gonna ask if you have have any chronic health conditions that were diagnosed within the last 12 months um, because this is actually a screening to see do we need to make sure that we're linking you with the right care uh, we're also going to ask if you're in crisis are you experiencing a medical or mental health crisis and if so we might connect you with a local emergency room or va hospital um, we are going to provide resources and information on our crisis hotlines homeless hotlines things like that to make sure that you get connected immediately if you are in crisis we're going to ask you questions and concerns about any of the following barriers to care, such as child care, language, learning or transportation needs, work schedule, benefits questions. So you may have heard already or will hear from our benefits partners. So VA, I'm going to talk to you a little bit later about how it's split into different parts. And we partner with veteran service or organizations and agencies that can help you to really take advantage of the benefits afforded to you as a veteran. That may be specific to you as an individual uh, and may also be specific to your community, such as things like property tax exemptions, things like that. So we're gonna ask if you have any questions about benefits, make sure you have a local point of contact. And that actually is listed in this slide deck as well for New York State Division of Veteran Services. But you'll see there, there are many agencies that might be able to assist you uh, with accessing these benefits and they're going to assist you for free. We're also going to ask you if you have any concerns with managing your overall care, overall care whether it be your mental health, wellness, uh, chronic health conditions. And we're going to ask you a little bit about social needs. So uh, any goals you might have related to education, employment uh, concerns, linkage to folks like the Department of Labor, uh, any financial concerns, perhaps you're uh, experiencing a change coming off orders and, and your family is in need of emergency financial resources or linkage to things like SNAP benefits, food stamps, um, um, applying for outside health insurance through your community uh, for your family, things like that. Housing instability, food insecurity, uh, concerns within your relationship related to intimate partner violence. Uh, and when we're done with that screen, we're going to ask you if you want any assistance ongoing with those needs, if you have identified any, and we're going to make sure that you have our contact information. So the VA's mission and value is always important to cite these. Uh, our mission is to care for those who have borne the battle and for their families and their survivors. Uh, we have I care values and they are integrity, commitment, advocacy, respect and excellence. There are three main parts to the VA organization. There's the Department of Veterans Affairs that oversees all of these parts and underneath that is the Veterans Benefits Ad Administration or VBA. The Veterans Health Administration, that's myself and my colleagues at, in healthcare, and the National Cemetery Administration, or the NCA. These administrations partner together, but we all have a little bit of a separate part. And what I mean by that is we might have separate systems, so it can be a little bit layered and confusing. And that's why we want to make sure you have points of contact that can assist you with this process and navigating the system. 
So for benefits, you're thinking more along the line of compensation, pension, uh, certain education benefits, home loan guarantee, life insurance, things like that. Under healthcare, we're really talking about things like primary care, mental health, and specialty care. And our National Cemetery Administration really honors our veterans and families with a final resting place and commemorates their service and sacrifice. So what is VA disability compensation? Uh, you, as I mentioned earlier, either may have heard already from our New York State Division of Veterans Services partners or may have already linked with a veterans benefits uh, counselor in your, your locality. Uh, so disability compensation is a tax-free benefit paid to veterans for an injury or illness that was incurred in or aggravated by military service including medical or mental health conditions that require ongoing treatment. So again, these are things that require ongoing treatment that happen to you either were incurred or aggravated while you were on orders. And uh, the importance of that as far as a healthcare provider's perspective is, if you become service connected, you're going to get free healthcare for these issues. There are some nuances around it. It is very individualized. That is why you certainly can apply online using e-benefits um, to file your own claim for disability and compensation. However, I highly encourage you to work with a veteran service agency. You wanna think a bit differently than just fitness for duty standards. You wanna think about things that you're gonna need ongoing treatment for that may not um, impact your fitness for duty. And so the other piece that you're going to want to think about is if you have a remaining commitment, are you going back on orders? Because you can't receive service-connected compensation at the same time as military pay. We do have a lot of folks, Guard and Reservists, who can become service-connected. When they're activated, they notify the VBA. But if you are going back on something like AGR or full-time orders, this is something that you may want to delay uh, and, and hold off on. So for assistance with submitting a claim for VA disability compensation, you might want to work with a New York State Veteran Benefits representative. I've included the link here uh, to identify those. But you might also work with a different entity, whether it be VFW, Disabled American Veterans, or your county veteran service agency. Um, any of those entities can assist you for free. Typically what they'll do is they'll have you sign a limited power of attorney to represent you in your claim so that they can have access to your medical records and assist you as an outside advocate. The other benefits that are really important to take a look at are your GI Bill benefits. These again are very ind individualized. So you really, we rely on this 1-800 number um, and, and looking at you individually based on things like time and service or if you paid into things like Montgomery GI Bill. There's also education and career counseling, and, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about that. That is through our benefits administration. A lot of veterans are taking advantage of that as they're looking at their next steps with their education and career. And there's something called Veteran Readiness and Employment, or VRNE, or Chapter 31, which is really if you have a service-related disability that impacts your ability to return to prior work um, and, and looking at gainful employment, you may need some retraining around that. So these are just, uh, again, a very broad overview of the education benefits under our VBA and a comparison. So highly recommend you take a look at more information online, really very individualized. Again, we have things like the post 9-11 GI Bill or Chapter 33. This, again, all of these have, you know, I should say most of these have minimal length of service requirements uh, and they have maximum months of benefits. So you want to take a look at that. They also have a duration of benefits. So you really want to make sure that you're looking at those in a timely fashion. Um, there are also some limitations around if folks are interested in transitioning their GI Bill benefits to dependents uh, related to existing time and service. So really want to take a look at that closely. Uh, there's Montgomery GI Bill, Chapter 30. There is also chap uh, Chapter 1606. Uh, and then there's VEEP. So this is degree training, non-college degree training, on-the-job apprenticeship, flight training, correspondence courses, license certifi certification tests, national testing programs, work study. Um, so you want to take a look at that benefit. Uh, and then there's DEA. So this is degree training, non-college training, on-the-job apprenticeship. Um, and this is specific to dependence education. So there's specific eligibilities and authorities around dependence education um, benefits or Chapter 35. Um, so you would need to explore if that applies to you. And again, the, the veteran service agencies are very helpful if you have specific questions in addition to the phone numbers and um, links and information that are online.
The Education and Career Counseling Chapter 36 is really personalized career planning and guidance. A lot of veterans are not quite aware of this. It's a fairly newer benefit, um, but what it does is it provides guidance and assistance with professionals who will help you to develop a personalized career and educational plan based on your unique goals. So you have to apply to use this benefits. It's not an automatic, uh, and they help to assess your skills and education and training to help you determine a civilian career path. They help to find the best training program to meet the job goals, determine your right educational program and school based on your future plan, and provide guidance on adjusting to the civilian world post transition. You may be eligible if you're leaving active service soon, or if you've been discharged in the past year, or if you're a veteran or dependent eligible for the VA education benefit. Our veteran, Veterans Readiness and Employment, again, this is the program that really helps veterans who have an identified service-related disability, so you'll already have to have gone through that service connection process, and you'll have to have been identified with a service-related disability that impacts your ability to achieve and maintain suitable employment, as well as gain independence in daily living. So there are two parts of that program. One is around the retraining, the other one is for independent living skills, and that's for our veterans who may be severely injured, things like moderate to major traumatic brain injury, things like that. Um, so this program, very hands-on, it provides job-seeking skills and assistance in finding employment or li independent living. Uh, if you're in, in the independent living track, it's working towards training in those activities of daily living, personal adjustment counseling and support services, and 48 months of training entitlement. This may be utilized within 12 years from the date of the initial VA disability rating. Active duty service members close to discharge and veterans can apply if they have a qualifying disability rating. So folks might be curious about how would somebody active duty have a qualifying disability rating. Um, back to kind of where we started, we are the conduit uh, post 11 program for when veterans are identified for being medically discharged or retired from the military. And when they go through that process, they may experience something where they opt to go into something called IDES, where they go through a process where they go, um, they are evaluated for concerns related to their fitness for duty and receive a military rating at the same time and concurrently as a VA rating for disability. In those instances, we have may have veterans who are transitioning off orders who already know they have a proposed VA rating for disability that impacts their ability to return to their prior employment. Uh, they also have veteran success on campus counselors. Um, so these are adjustment counseling to resolve problems interfering with completion of the education programs and entrance into employment. This might include some vocational testing, education and career counseling, and support and assistance to all veterans with VA benefits regardless of their entitlement and benefit usage or enrollment status. So again, these are you know programs under our VBA. Really important that you take a look a little bit more closely. All of these are live links, but also consult with a veteran service agency. And so they have uh, several uh, education benefits under the Veterans Technology Education courses. Vet Tech really pairs eligible veterans with market leading training providers offering sought after high tech training and skills development. If you have at least one day of unexpired GI Bill entitlement, then you may be eligible for the Vet Tech. What types of training are included include information science, computer programming, data processing, media applications, and computer software programs. So this has a link again to apply for Vet Tech website. And the employment uh, employer consortium is another part of that. And that really helps bridge the gap between program completion and that meaningful employment. And it fosters that network of employers and training providers for graduates to leverage at the beginning of and throughout their careers. So again, another great benefit you might want to explore and take advantage of. Some of our time sensitive benefits that we want to be mindful is the group life insurance. So veterans group life insurance, you want to apply within 240 days post separation uh, and to apply without proof of good health or one year and, um, and 120 days post separation with proof of good health. So again, really important, talk to your veteran service officer about this. Um, service group life insurance applies with it. You need to apply within two years post separation and the service disabled veteran insurance apply within two years post rating. So these are various life insurance programs that you might be eligible for. Really wanna take a look at that and be proactive because they are time sensitive. Same thing with those education benefits. Um, so again, really take a look at that uh, and make sure you're taking advantage of those benefits before they expire. 
Um, this is a very busy slide. There's a lot of information on here, um, but want to make sure that veterans are aware of the PACT Act or the Promise to Address Comprehensive Toxins Act. This was something that was recently signed into law by President Biden, and it was named after Sergeant First Class Heath Robinson, who was an Ohio National Guard uh, Guard member, and he served in Iraq and deployed uh, and so when he returned uh, following his last deployment, unfortunately, he developed lung cancer and an autoimmune disorder as a result of burn pit exposure and passed away at the age of 39 in May of 2020. Uh, so the, this PACT Act was named after, after him. And really what, what this does is actually expansive legislation that is looking at environmental contaminants exposures across the board, not just our post 9-11 or Persian Gulf era veterans, but also our Vietnam era veterans, veterans who may have had garrison exposure. You may hear about things like Camp Lejeune um, and also looking at uh, what we call presumptive conditions. So there are different parts of this legislation, making sure that VA healthcare is being provided. So it expands some enrollment and eligibility to VA healthcare for veterans who have served an active duty in theater of combat operations during a period of war, including the Persian Gulf War. Um, and this was, you know, different expansions. So currently, um, we are in the one where anyone who is discharged September 11th, 2001 to October 1st, 2013 may enroll in VA health care if, if perhaps they previously did not enroll under their combat eligibility um, or other eligibility. So we want to make sure that we're sharing this information with our fellow service members and veterans, uh, making sure that veterans are applying for VA health care. Perhaps they had not thought of this before. Uh, the other piece of this legislation is making sure on the health care side of the house, we're screening for this. So if you're established with VA healthcare, every five years, some your VA healthcare provider is going to ask you a little bit about environmental contaminants exposure. There are registry exams I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, which is more of the research arm. And then there are what we call presumptive conditions, where basically the Benefits Administration and our VA research has identified that there are so many veterans that unfortunately have been um, exposed to certain things, whether it be Agent Orange, burn pit, ionizing radiation, and there are presumed conditions associated with those exposures during certain time frames. And so if you were to file a claim and have been diagnosed with these exposures, you may already automatically be service connected without needing to provide a whole lot of evidence. So I want to make sure that these um, these presumptive conditions are talked about uh, and highlighted in these slides because um, many of our veterans uh, are returning from deployment to these areas, but also have served in those areas previously. Unfortunately, these conditions um, do include several types of cancers, head and neck cancers, as well as respiratory diseases and conditions, asthma, chronic rhinitis, chronic sinusitis. Um, so, so really making sure that you take a look at this list. If you are diagnosed with these concerns and you've served in an area where you've had this burn pit exposure during this time of service post 9-11, um, then you may want to file a claim for VA disability compensation. And again, what that would afford to you if you become service connected is some compensation for that injury or illness, but also ensuring that you get free VA health care for those concerns. The registry examinations are really a research part of the VA. So these registry exams exist so that we can make sure that we have documented some of the concerns, exposure concerns that you've had, where you were located, um, but it's really not going to afford any kind of treatment or benefits. So we want to be really clear about that. Uh, the different types of registry are based on the period of military service, the exposure type of concern, uh, and where you are located. And so you really want to take a look at these links. Uh, we have various registry exams. The majority are in-person exams that you would request at your local VA medical center. They're available to you regardless of whether or not you've applied for VA health care. It's, it's separate from that. Um, However, the burn pit uh, registry is actually the initial part of that is online. So if you go online, you can register for the burn pit registry and complete that registry exam online. And then if you still want a follow up appointment in person, you can request that after you've completed the online portion. So on to Veterans Health Care Administration. This is the health benefits application. I believe uh, you've been provided the 1010 Easy application in your packets. I highly encourage you to consider um, 
applying online. Uh, it is likely going to be faster. However, if you send those applications in, we will still accept them. Very important then when you, you do apply that you've given us some information, including uh, most recent DD-214, because that's going to impact your eligibility. The income is optional. However, there are times where income will impact in eligibility. So particularly if you are um, low income, you want to provide that information. It will also impact your copay status. So if you do apply and you become eligible for VA health Healthcare copays are impacted by what we call priority groups. So that's how you're enrolled if you're service connected, a prisoner of war, um, but also income standards. So if you're under a certain income threshold, even if you're not in a um, say, for example, priority group one veterans are, are, are highly service connected, 100 percent service connected veterans. Um, even if you're not a priority group one veteran, you might still not have co-pays if you are low income. A lot of folks that are coming off orders have change in income, and this application is going to ask you about last year's annual income. If you talk to your local medical center, you may be uh, able to be assisted with, with enrollment um, by the enrollment folks related to a waiver. So if your income has changed greatly, obviously you're off orders. Um, it might be important that you complete a, a means test waiver. So the several ways to apply, certainly you can locate your local VA medical center, bring in that DD-214 and income information. Um, what you're going to need can be listed in this uh, online if you take a look at that first, but you can also do this online or over the phone. If you're going to apply over the phone, it has to be this 1-800 number. It cannot be over the phone at your local VA. It's just the way the VA works. Um, that number is the health eligibility center that will take down that information uh, and process your eligibility and enrollment. So eligibility for VA healthcare depends on the following factors. It's service in the active military, naval or air service that didn't receive a dishonorable discharge. If you enlisted after 1980, September 7th, 1980, or entered active duty after October 16, 1981, you have to have uh, served 24 continuous months or for our guard and reservists, the full period for which you were called to active duty, unless any of the descriptions below are true. And this um, would, in, the minimum, minimum duty requirement may not apply if you are discharged for a disability that was caused or made worse by your active duty service. So if you have a medical discharge or retirement, you were discharged for hardship or early out, or you served prior to nine, uh, September 7th, 1980. If you served in certain locations and time periods during the Vietnam War era, this might also um, lead to a, uh, the exclusion of that minimum duty requirement. So again, very individualized, but as you apply, you, you would be notified if and why uh, you were determined to be eligible or ineligible. So, a little bit more, if you're a current former member of the Reserves or National Guard, you must have been called to active duty by federal order on Title 10 and completed the full period. So, so that active duty is really referring to that federal Title 10 orders. Um, Title 32 service does not count towards minimum duty requirement, and this is often uh, confusing for our Guard and Reservists who may have served on Title 32. For that uh, those types of orders, if you perhaps have not deployed to an area that would um, entitle you to VA health care, uh, for those Title 32 orders, if you become service connected for a condition that was incurred on those orders, then you may be eligible, you will be eligible for VA health care for those conditions. So just uh, important to know. In most cases, family members and dependents are not eligible for VA health care. Uh, you can check whether your dependents may be eligible under CHAMP VA eligibility. There's a typically reserved, CHAMP VA is typically reserved for 100% service connected veterans and for family members who do not have uh, access to other health care insurance, such as Medicare or TRICARE. So again, if you have um, some questions about that, curious about that, please take a look at the CHAMP VA website. Dental care is a limited benefit at the VA, and so if you've recently separated uh, and you serve for 90 days or more and you have that DD-214, you want to take a look at that. If it says that you did not receive dental um, prior to your separation, there's a little box that says yes or no. If it says no, you may be eligible for that um, for 180 days time limited dental treatment at the VA. And that would conclude a cleaning and exam. Uh, and if there's a condition that's uh, of a concern by our dentist, they're gonna take a look at that and cover you under that benefit, but it's very time limited. You wanna make sure when you enroll, you tell your all the, your sorry, your local VA uh, business office that you're interested in that dental ben benefit. There's a little bit extra paperwork um, for that dental benefit and they will make sure that's provided to the dental clinic and then they'll schedule you. As long as you've been scheduled within that 180 days, um, you can use that benefit.
And there is also a VA dental insurance program. I, I apologize, let me backtrack a little bit. If you become service connected for a dental condition or 100%, there are other um, eligibilities for VA dental clinics. So if you have interest in, in VA dental overall, certainly take a look at that. Talk to the business office and enrollment team. Uh, the VA dental insurance program is something that you would pay into. It's discounted private dental insurance for veterans who meet certain requirements. So if you find out um, that you, you are not going to have dental benefits or you, you're interested uh, in exploring them through the VA, please take a look at the VADIP information. I believe right now we're, we're contracted with MetLife and Delta. So this, these benefits are again, something that you would, um, it's discounted, you would pay to have and utilize in the community. So combat eligibility is something that I believe is going to apply to a lot of folks that are returning from these uh, uh, from these deployments right now. And the PACT Act recently extended that. It, uh, it started out when we first started these conflicts, um, you know, it was a, a, a very time limited two year eligibility, then it went to five year. Now it's been extended to 10 years. So again, want to make sure that if our veterans have served on active duty in a theater of combat operations during a period of war after the Persian Gulf War, or in combat against a hostile force during a period of hostilities after November 11th, 1998, then you want to make sure if they've been discharged and released in this time frame that they apply for VA health care. And what this combat eligibility does is it affords veterans who have served in these locations free health care during that time period. And really that clock starts after you're discharged. So that 10 year period would start from that date of discharge 10 years uh, forward. And that allows for you to come into the VA and, and have a history and physical and get assessment and treatment for any deployment related conditions for free. If you have other conditions that are not deployment related, you can still get treatment for those conditions. You just might have a copay based on the way that you're enrolled. But if it's deployment related, you wanna make sure that you tell your providers and they'll be able to check out those encounters as com under that combat vet eligibility so that you don't have any copays. And this would include imaging, medications, anything related. VA healthcare services. So um, VA healthcare services are pretty expansive. We have primary care, which is really that initial conduit, right, to that specialty care. So really important that you come in every year, once a year uh, for your annual health, history and physical with your primary care provider. And they're really gonna be that conduit for any referrals to specialty care. So you're really not fully established with the VA until you're established with a primary care team. And we really recommend you come in annually for those history and physicals. We have mental health care. I'm gonna go over some of the programs Programs, but we have expansive mental health care and treatment, preventative care, specialty care, care management. So that's that care coordination I talked about a little bit earlier. We have that in the post 9-11 program, but also specialized in other areas, perhaps oncology, dialysis, things like that. Women's health care, geriatrics and palliative care, long-term services and support, LGBTQ support programs, military sexual trauma programs, care in the community. So uh, certainly, uh, this is kind of a larger, broader topic that I'm not going to get into too much, but if you are um, enrolled in VA healthcare, we look at things like access and location to care, and we want to make sure that our veterans are able to have good access, get in a timely manner based on a clinically indicated date, and also make sure that you don't have to travel too far. So um, eligibility for community care is very nuanced. It's, it's looking at the certain type of care that is being requested, whether or not we have that in the time frame that it is needed or if you have to travel further for that. So this might also include things like urgent care and ED care in the community if you're not co-located with your local VA medical center. So you really want to take a look at what that is. First step, though, is to become enrolled and established. So enroll in VA health care, establish primary care, and that opens up that community care um, access for care uh, through VA. <clears throat> So treatment of active duty service members, we have a lot of folks that stay on as a um, activated uh, Title 32 orders, active guard reserve, um, active duty special work, things like that. So we want to make sure that you're educated on this. So um, VA is not a military treatment facility. There's oftentimes some confusion around that. We are, we do partner with TRICARE in that we have, um, we are approved TRICARE providers, but our veterans take priorities. So what that means is every six months, each VA medical center is going to look at their access for their veterans, and they may or may not accept TRICARE patients. Um, 
majority of VAs, but not all, do not accept dependents. I know our Northport site, I believe, does. So you also, if you're a dependent, you want to make sure that you talk to that VA. It also has to do with whether or not, um, <clears throat> you know, your duty location and your home of record and whether or not you're co-located with a military treatment facility and within uh, 50 miles of that military treatment facility. Um, so <clears throat> if you are established with your local military treatment facility. Again, this is service members, not uh, not dependents. Uh, and they recommend specialty care. They may authorize you to receive care at the VA. So you might get a referral, a TRICARE authorization from your primary care provider at the military treatment facility to access VA health care for specialty services. In the case of true emergency situations where active duty individual presents to VA health care facility, you want to make sure that you are um, telling them that you're active duty. Uh, so if you're not already registered, they're registering you as such, and you may need to follow up with the VA because sometimes when you come to the ED, it's after hours, right? Um, and again, VA is a healthcare benefit. It's not like a, a community hospital. So uh, we want to make sure that we have you registered properly, and it's not like you're going to hand over an insurance card per se. And so we want to make sure that you're registered under your active duty status uh, so that your TRICARE is billed. In that instance, you don't need prior authorization if you need care in the emergency room at the VA, um, but you are going to want to try contact TRICARE and follow up and let them know about that. Uh, prescriptions are not filled at VA's pharmacy except those sites with interagency agreements. So written prescription may be provided to the patient to fill uh, in an outside pharmacy. So this slide really talks a lot about what I talked about. So again, VA have been active TRICARE network providers since 1995. Um, we want to make sure that we have you registered properly. So if you're on orders, you need to let us know. If you were enrolled previously as a veteran and you flip back on orders, you need to let us know. You cannot continue that care as a veteran if you're active duty. Basically, our billing folks will say there is no such thing as an active duty veteran. You're one or the other. Um, so when you come off orders, you just let our business office and enrollment folks know that you're off orders. Perhaps you have an updated DD-214 or orders to provide to them. Um, if And they will tell you if you're able to come back into VA under that veteran's health care status. Um, again, very individualized. Uh, for TRICARE assistance, again, you guys are going to have a TRICARE briefing, certainly defer to TRICARE, um, and, and you're going to want to make sure that your, your enrollment is updated in DEERS, um, and we've pr provided the contact information for the TRICARE East Region and Humana. Vet Center Readjustment Counseling Centers are something that are under the VA healthcare umbrella, but a bit separate. So we want to make sure that we highlight the importance of them and provide you the information. Vet Centers were really established Vietnam era veterans. Um, really wanted more of a peer support model, really wanted to talk to other veterans who had experienced this period of readjustment. Um, and it's separate from VA healthcare in that the enrollment or eligibility is different. Uh, you really have to have met criteria to be eligible for the Vet Center Readjustment Counseling Center. I'm going to go over that a little bit. You self-refer. It's not a consult model, so veterans call and self-refer, and the record system is separate. So um, we do now share records with Department of Defense, uh, so there are certainly service members who have concerns about um, disclosing certain things or having shared record. No one should be in your record. We still follow HIPAA and privacy standards, but um, there may be times where a certain, uh, for example, uh, problem in your problem list or uh, event um, will trigger a notification to medical command, things like that. So we want to make sure that you're aware of that. But also a lot of uh, active duty service members, um, perhaps you go on and off orders and you're not wanting to deal with that TRICARE referral process, veteran enrollment process. Um, they choose to stay with the vet center because you don't have to worry about that. Uh, and they also like the fact that they have a separate record system for that added privacy. So who's eligible? Any veteran or active duty service member to include activated members of the National Guard and Reserve components who've served in combat theater or other eligibility. So services offered at vet centers nationwide include individual and group counseling for veterans, service members, and families, family counseling for military-related issues, bereavement counseling for families who have experienced an active duty death, military sexual trauma counseling and referral, 
outreach and education. So they oftentimes are involved in post-deployment health reassessment events, community events, and screening and referral for things that might require additional services, um, such as benefits. Oftentimes they have a benefits counselor, substance abuse. So um, if we need things like detox, medication management, and mental health concerns, they're going to refer on to VA Medical Center. That new eligibility, again, these are links that you can take a look at. It, it really extends Vet Center eligibility to certain members of the armed forces, including National Guard Reserve components who actively served in response to national emergency or major disasters. So this is a newer eligibility, uh, eligibility very important. Um, and so this includes civil response uh, it, by the president or under orders of the chief executive of the state in response to a disaster or civil disorder. So this could be combat operations or area of hostility, unmanned aerial vehicle operations, military sexual trauma, mortuary services, or direct medical or mental health care for casualty of war, response to national emergency or major disasters declared by, um, by the president, such as COVID, um, National Guard under orders of the chief executive of the state, and United States Coast Guard drug interdiction operations. Want to make sure veterans uh, and service members and families are aware of our crisis hotlines, um, things that are needed in, in, you know, urgent situations and times. Um, so this is the military and veterans crisis hotline. It's available 24/7. Call, text, or chat. The number, the new number is 988. The old number still works at 1-800-273-TALK. But 988, and you press one for veterans. And this is going to get you a live person. There's also that that text and chat. So the, the crisis hotline is something that a lot of veterans and family use when they're experiencing an emotional crisis. You have the opportunity to opt in to having that information shared with a local medical center um, or to decline that. And if it is shared, what will happen is you'll be linked with our local suicide prevention team. We have case managers and a program coordinator. Um, and certainly, if there are concerns specific to your safety, um, what the crisis hotline might also do is send out a health and welfare check. So we partner with community um, police and law enforcement typically. Um, there are also some mobile crisis teams, depends on your community, um, that will do a health and welfare check to ensure the safety of the veteran. Um, and if need be, they can transport um, the veteran into the local hospital um, for further assessment and treatment. We also have a hotline for our VA Healthcare for Homeless Veterans program. So veterans who are homeless or at risk of homelessness can contact the VA for housing assistance. It doesn't, we don't provide emergency housing. We, we rely on local shelters, um, but we do have both long-term and short-term housing assistance programs. Um, so we wanna make sure that veterans and service members and families are aware of this number um, and certainly this, this hotline. I will say I'm not an expert in the recent eligibility, but they have expanded this. So so um, this is also available, the Veterans Healthcare for Homeless Program, uh, Homeless Veterans Program rather, to any veterans who have completed one day of active duty service and veterans with other than honorable discharges. They might still be eligible ho for housing services, even if they're, they're not eligible for VA healthcare. So that number is 1-877-424-3838 or 1-877-48-VET. And again, that's 24-7. Our Women Veterans Healthcare is a program that we're very proud of. Um, this offers, uh, you know, a hotline or a call center also. I shouldn't say hotline, um, but if you are a female veteran and you're curious about women's health care, please contact that number. Uh, each VA, similar to our Post Line 11 Military to VA program, each VA has a Women Veteran Program Manager and specialty services specific to our women's health. And so that might include things like mental health services related to PTSD, military sexual trauma, and homelessness. Uh, it could be uh, mixed gender resident, um, residential inpatient programs uh, and regional or national resources for the women's tract, or it could be maternity care coordination. So a lot of our veterans and service members don't recognize VA does provide maternity care coordination. We actually uh, utilize our community care benefit for that. So uh, if you are pregnant and enrolled in VA health care, what you would do is identify a uh, community OBGYN and VA would pay for that. This would include prenatal care, delivery of the baby up to six weeks postpartum, visits with your local OB or certified nurse midwife and newborn coverage for seven days following birth. So really important that our women veterans know more about that program. Certainly feel free to contact your local women veteran program coordinator if you have additional questions.
We also have an LGBTQ plus health program for service members and veterans. So this is ensuring that uh, veterans will choose VA to receive affirming care services to achieve optimal health and well-being. Uh, available health care services include fertility and family planning, gender affirm affirming hormone therapy, prosthetics, speech therapy, um, our, our umbrella of mental health services, intimate partner violence, primary care and prevention care, um, certainly substance abuse, tobacco use, all of those things. Um, so to learn more about that, please take a look at this link. Um, and there is also an LGBTQ plus veteran care coordinator at every VA medical center. So um, your local VA medical center will have a point of contact that can help you um, to access this care and benefits. And we also have some information here, um, some links and, and um, QR code to give you some information a little bit specific, more specific related to coming out to your healthcare provider, um, services available for transgender men, transgender women, uh, healthcare for gay and bisexual men and women, um, and, and information on applying for discharge upgrade, because we know in some instances with Don't Ask, Don't Help, Tell, our veterans um, who are LGBTQ plus may have received an other than honorable discharge. VA uses the term military sexual trauma to refer to sexual assault or sexual harassment experienced during military service. This includes sexual activity during military service in which you were involved against your will or when I, unable to say no. Examples might include being pressured or coerced in sexual activities such as threats of negative treatment if you refuse to cooperate, sexual contact or activities without your consent, including when you were asleep or intoxicated, being overpowered or physically forced to have sex, being touched or grabbed in sexual ways that made you feel uncomfortable, including during hazing experiences, comments about your body or sexual activities that you found threatening, and unwanted sexual advances that you found threatening. Eligibility for MST-related care is for all individuals with veteran status um, and most service members with other than honorable or uncharacterized entry-level discharge. So what that means is there are specific, specific eligibility afforded to veterans who have experienced military sexual trauma. We recognize when this occurs, there are instances where veterans may have experienced other than honorable discharges or things like that. Um, MST-related care is also available to former National Guard and Reserve members, again, with federal active duty service or service-connected disability who were discharged under honorable conditions. Um, so the service-connected disability does not need to be related to their MST, but uh, somebody who was in the National Guard and Reserve, they have to either have had that federal active duty service or have a service-connected disability, as I mentioned earlier, those Title 32 folks, um, to access VA uh, military sexual trauma care. Current services um, include, uh, you know, services at our vet centers, which I, I mentioned, um, but also at the VA. And so there's a, an MST coordinator uh, at, at every facility, as I keep mentioning with other programs, really best to contact that local coordinator um, to have that conversation. Many of our veterans and service members are not comfortable uh, expressing this experience when they're applying for VA health care. So certainly if you're a veteran or know of one who has applied for VA health care and been denied VA health care but has experienced military sexual trauma, may be really important that they contact their MST coordinator. And, and what they're going to do is they're going to really be able to guide you around questions about treatment and healthcare options related to MST. And again, these are going to be available at every VA medical center or outpatient clinic. Most often these are, um, if you are eligible only under that MST eligibility. <clears throat> Most often these are going to be in behavioral health services, but um, again, in guidance and coordination with that MST coordinator, it may also include the treatment of physical health conditions related to the MST. The VA Intimate Partner Violence or IPV Assistance Program is really specific to um, all of our veterans being screened for intimate partner violence. We're making sure if you're enrolled in VA healthcare, we're asking questions about your relationship, uh, health and safety. You certainly, as with every screening that we do, have the right to decline. Um, and we're very cautious about documenting that in the chart. So you'll also be asked whether or not it's okay for us to document that in your chart. Uh, we do have an IPV coordinator at every VA, and I'm going to share a little bit about uh, national statistics about domestic violence according to the National Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and rates of reported intimate partner violence. So uh, just a little bit about that definition. Uh, contact sexual violence is defined as rape being made to penetrate someone else, sexual coercion, or un unwanted sexual contact perpetrated by int intimate partners. So that's how we um, 
we define contact sexual violence. Uh, so according to the National Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, approximately 16% of women and 7% of men have experienced contact sexual violence by an intimate partner in their lifetime. Approximately 23% of women and 14% of men, men have experienced severe physical violence by an intimate partner in their lifetime. Approximately 40% of women and 41% of men have experienced coercive control by an intimate partner. Approximately 40%, 47% of women and 47% of men have experienced psychological aggression. And approximately 10% of women and 2% of men have experienced stalking by an intimate partner. So again, those, those are kind of alarming um, statistics, so to speak, when we're talking about intimate partner violence. Very important to consider um, that it, it's more common than I think a lot of folks realize. And so we want to make sure that we're screening and talking about this and that we have resources available because there are oftentimes safety concerns. And this is very layered. And there, there are times where there may also be what we call bi-directional violence in a relationship, not necessarily always perpetrated by one person. So um, we want to make sure that you have some information um, on the VA Intimate Partner Violence Program, that you make sure um, that, we, that you have the contact information for the site coordinator, and, and we do utilize the National Domestic Violence Hotline, um, so VA does not have their own or the military does not have their own, uh, and that's 1-800-799-SAFE. Um, so certainly those are resources that are available, and as I mentioned, we're going to be screening any of our veterans who are established with VA Health Care for intimate partner violence to make sure that you have resources available if that is something that you're experiencing. Uh, I should also mention VA, certain VAs, including Albany VA, may have specific uh, treatment programs available to veterans who are experiencing violence or who use violence in relationships. Uh, so certainly you may have heard of things called batterers intervention courses that are mandated by courts. Um, VA has their own model of this uh, that is approved um, by courts that is specific to, right now at Albany, I believe this is specific to male veterans. I don't know if we have one for female veterans that use violence in relationships um, that will satisfy that court mandate. And it's very specific to a veteran's experience because we know some of our veterans in military training um, may experience things in relationships differently just based upon what they've gone through or what their training has been. Some caregiver and family resources we want to make sure that we share. Um, we have a coaching into care hotline. So this is specific to our, again, families, um, caregivers or veterans. If you have a veteran or service member who's returned and you really feel that they um, would benefit from getting established with mental health treatment, that things are changed, that they need some care, um, but, but you've tried and just um, have not really been able to get them established, this coaching into care provides free coaching to help you and your veteran because we know that returning home can be a tough adjustment and that we know that at the end of the day our veterans are with their families right so we want to make sure that we're supporting our families and they can often are often the first person or our people to recognize when someone has changed and, and something um has changed in the relationship or in that person. We also have a caregiver support hotline. So if you're caring for a veteran, this caregiver support program, um, we have lots of different caregiver support programs available. There are two major parts, the general caregiver support program, which is really that coaching, mentoring, support services, um, sometimes even counseling, specific to caregiving of that veteran. Uh, or there's the comprehensive caregiver support program, which is more specific to veterans who have severe um, injuries, illnesses, you have to be a, a certain service connection rating uh, and need assistance with activities of daily living. So rather than paying, uh, say, for example, a home health aid, VA is paying these families to provide this care. Um, other transition resources include VA Solid Start Program, uh, DOD's In Transition Program. I mention these because you might actually get calls related to this. The Solid Start Program is through the VA. It's more specific to benefits administration. You might get a call um, during your first year of separation. Department of Defense also contracts with an In Transition Program. So this is something that um, if you've been identified as having a mental health condition, you might already be identified as getting these coaching calls from the In Transition Program, really assisting service members with establishing care, whether it be with VA or community. 
resources listed here just in case folks want additional information, as well as contact information for your local transition and care management program members, your post line 11 program members uh, in, in New York, throughout New York. So want to make sure that you take a look uh, closely at this slide and please reach out to your local program coordinator. Make sure you get linked with programs and services. Um, they will likely be contacting you for a screening anyway, but reach out to them if you need any assistance getting established with care. So thank you so much for your time. Truly appreciate it. Thank you for your service. Um, and if you have any concerns, please don't hesitate to reach out to the VA.